Thank you for listening to Tales from Witchhaven. This podcast is created by Dan Lee and Rodeo Whiter and produced by Rodiax. Hello and thanks for tuning in. I'm Jackson Thorne reporting to you from JT Auto Repairs for all your motoring needs. As always, I'm joined by co-host and published author Imelda Blackwood. Thank you, Jackson. If you're a regular listener, welcome back. If this is the first time you've tuned in, congratulations, you've made it. On this public access radio show, we aim to uncover all of the mysteries of our sleepy little town and expose them for what they are. A dark conspiracy, a supernatural threat from the great beyond, or just a big misunderstanding. A couple of interesting things have happened to us this week. Hopefully we've got time for them all. Let's start with the autumn fair. Okay. As you all know, we have an autumn fair in the town where everyone gets together and sells things that they've been making. Well, this year Imelda entered the photo competition with her photo of the old watermill, and she won. What was the prize again? A £28 voucher for the crooked kettle and tea for two at the Laughing Toad's Tea Room. Would you like to join me for afternoon tea, Jackson? I would indeed. While at the fair, we were making our way around the spell tent, and we saw some incredible spells this year, didn't we? We did. I love the one that makes knives and forks burst into fireworks and dance across your dining table if you say Wilberforce. Yeah, that one annoyed me. Well, while we were there, I wanted to get a glimpse of the gingerbread man parade. I'd never seen it before. I'm glad I did this time. I'd never seen so many gumdrop buttons in one place. We also went to the theatre to see our very own Trimble Tollenbuster's latest movie, The Giant's Eye. I really enjoyed that film. It really spoke to me. Well, apparently, this film is supposed to be cursed. It's said that whoever watches it will be met with a great misfortune and will be haunted by the crying clown. While we were in the theatre, we heard a scream from outside. We all rushed to see what the bother was, and in the fountain was one of the wailing spectres, warning us not to see this film. Apparently, when this was being made, there were a lot of accidents on set. I heard that as well. It was filmed at the old castle on the hill that allegedly still has the ghost of the court jester roaming its halls, looking for his next victim to bring sorrow to. I thought jesters were supposed to make people laugh. This one did. He would make the whole court laugh, but he couldn't make the king laugh. And so he was executed. After that, the crying jester could be heard every night there were guests in the castle. Maybe that's the case for the future. It certainly could be. But definitely go and see The Giant's Eye. I think Trimble Tollenbuster will be attending the screening this coming Thursday, where he'll be doing a signing. He said Friday to me. Yeah, it is Friday to him. His Friday is our Thursday and his Tuesday is our Sunday. It must be an actor thing. So, moving on to this week's investigation... It began when Mrs Clitheroe came into the garage to get a new tail light for her delivery van. While I was fitting it, I couldn't help but notice that she was talking funny, so I asked her if there was anything wrong. It turned out that during the night a couple of her teeth had mysteriously disappeared. Of course, when Jackson told me, I just assumed it was yet another ailment caused by all of the sugary treats she sells at the bakery. She tells everyone that she doesn't eat any of her stock, but no one gets to look like Mrs Clitheroe does without eating ice buns and fairy cakes every day. She listens to this show, doesn't she? Every week. So she had a couple of teeth missing? Uh, yes, she did. She had no idea what had happened to them, but in the night, while she was asleep, they vanished. She did, however, have a crumpled piece of paper left by her bed with a smiley face on it, and in the corner a small emblem of what looked like a pickaxe crossing over a fishing rod. We were obviously intrigued by this case and had to investigate. So first of all, we started how we always do, with a cup of tea and a biscuit with the victim. We didn't have to supply the biscuits this time though, did we? Mrs Clitheroe had some in her handbag. They were lovely. Just a note to the listeners, if you're walking past the bakery at any point, I would certainly recommend that you just quickly call in and ask for a couple of the chocolate sparkle cookies. Make sure you wait for the fireworks to stop shooting out of the biscuits before you bite down on it, though. Ooh, don't forget the laughing muffins as well. I don't like those ones. They did give me a bit of a shock, I must admit. 
If you haven't tried one yet, they look like ordinary muffins. But when you take your first bite, they start laughing at you in the most mocking manner, and they don't stop until you've eaten it. The first time I had one of those was at Archie Feather's funeral. I remember. I couldn't stop laughing. Neither could the muffin. I remember once Mrs Clitheroe got the recipe wrong, and instead of laughing, the muffins would yell abuse at whoever was eating them, and at anyone who happened to be passing by, for that matter. Anyway, we were at the bakery having tea with Mrs Clitheroe. That's right. She told us that she'd just had some major dental work done, and her teeth were as good as new. Better than they'd ever been. Or so she thought. As I recall, she was in a half-mind to sue the dentist. That's right. But we convinced her to hold off until we had finished the investigation. So our next port of call was, of course, the dental practice. Terence Hendry is the dentist there, but he has everyone call him Dr Teeth on account of his middle names. Terence Edward Egbert Thomas Hendry is his full name. Apparently he comes from a family of dentists. He took us into his surgery and was happy to answer our questions. We asked him if it was possible for the teeth that he had worked on to fall out. To which he was quite taken aback. He explained that in extenuating circumstances, one tooth might fall out, but only if its owner was mistreating it. But two teeth to simply fall out overnight? Not a chance. Even if they had a fallen out, they'd be somewhere in her bed or on her pillow, and it still wouldn't explain the note that was left on her bedside table. No, in my opinion, Dr Teeth is clean. It must have been something else. Well, the only thing we could do was go back to Mrs Clitheroe's house and wait there overnight to see if anything strange happened again. We waited up all night, guarding her bedroom door from any unwanted visitors. But nothing. We didn't see or hear anything untoward. We drank so much coffee that night. Indeed. We waited up all night and decided to take a walk home once the sun had started to rise probably around 6am. We went for yet another coffee and some breakfast at the Crooked Kettle, after we'd slept for a couple of hours. We had planned to go there simply to regroup and mull over what could have possibly caused Mrs Clitheroe's teeth to disappear, but I think we got a little more than we bargained for. That's right. While we were tucking into our beans on toast, we overheard something quite alarming. Someone on a neighbouring table was rubbing his jaw and talking to his wife about his missing teeth. It seemed that this was not an isolated incident. After speaking to him, we discovered that he had experienced the exact same trauma as Mrs Clitheroe, teeth disappearing overnight, and the same scrap of paper waiting for him in the morning. We had to take action. Now, of course, we are aware of fairies in our little town, Although the only fairy that has a fascination with teeth certainly wouldn't pry them from somebody's mouth. They wait until the tooth falls out and then collect it. Oh, they still give me the heebie-jeebies. Well, that was two people now, maybe even a third that night. But by this point we were starting to get really tired, so we decided to go home, have a nap, and meet back up again in the evening. And that's exactly what we did. I was on my way to meet Jackson outside the Crooked Kettle. The bakery is directly across the square from the Crooked Kettle, as you know, and as I passed it, I could hear a fresh batch of muffins laughing as they baked. That's how Mrs Clitheroe traps the laughter inside of them. It was really quite an unnerving sound wafting towards me from the gloom of the shop, so I hurried past quickly. I know, I hate walking past a bakery at night. Well, anyway, on my way to the Crooked Kettle, I heard rustling in the bushes of the park on the opposite side of the road. I couldn't see anything and I thought it must just be the wind. Then I heard it again. This time I was certain it definitely wasn't the wind. I moved a couple of steps closer to the bushes. I stepped forwards with trepidation. I still couldn't see anything. That was when I saw you down the road. That's right, you were waving at me trying to get my attention. Yes, and you were distracted by something else. I was. I had also heard what I thought to be rustling in the bushes. I was silently waving my arms at Jackson, trying to get his attention without making my presence known. Then I heard a laugh, a small giggle coming from the bushes. I was hoping someone had dropped a muffin in there earlier. However, I don't think they had, because I took another step closer to the bush, and something shot out and made its way at lightning pace around the back of the bakery. The exact same thing happened to me as well. A small giggle, then a shadow rushing towards the bakery. 
We knocked on the door of the bakery, and Mrs. Clitheroe answered. We told her what we had seen, well, what we had heard, and thought we'd seen, and she hadn't seen anything, or heard anything. I assured her that there was definitely a shadow that ran around the back of the bakery, about a foot tall and laughing. We asked if we could take a look around, and see the garden as well. So we did. We made our way around the kitchen, and the seating area, Nothing. We made our way up the stairs and into the stores. We were met with perfect stillness and silence. Then we made our way into the garden. We heard it, all three of us. We heard it rustling, and then the laughter. Then we saw the shadow dart out from under a table and splash into the pond. Mrs Clitheroe then told us that whoever took her teeth must have taken her garden gnomes as well, because they were no longer there. That's when two and two suddenly made four again. Something about a foot tall, with a high-pitched giggle. It was a gnome. <laughs> Sorry, that still makes me laugh. The gnome did it. Mrs Clitheroe didn't find it very funny, did she? Mm. Well, we needed to catch one of the gnomes, but it was useless trying to run around the garden and herd them. They were way too quick. We needed to set a trap. Both of the gnome's victims had been asleep when the gnome struck, so that's what we needed, a sleeping victim with teeth. You can guess, dear listeners, who that pleasure fell to, can't you? Well, it couldn't be me, could it? I had to operate the cage. It was a washing basket. One man's washing basket is another gnome's prison cell. You know, I should write a book. Please don't. OK, so Imelda fell asleep in Mrs Clitheroe's bed and I silently waited in the cupboard, waiting for one of them to come in. After you fell asleep, I only waited for about ten minutes or so before the door opened. There it was, a short, porcelain-esque man with a beard and a hat, wearing green dungarees and smiling. He poked his head around the door, and then waved behind him. Then another three waddled through the door, one of them carrying a pickaxe and another one carrying a fishing rod. Now, I wanted to see what they were going to use the fishing rod for, but I don't think Imelda would have wanted me to find out. No, I certainly wouldn't. I did, however, watch them get onto the bed. One of them climbed onto the shoulders of another, and the other two used them as a ladder to climb up. And then they pulled the other duo up onto the bed. That must have been astounding, if not slightly comedic to witness. That's why it took me so long to spring from the wardrobe. I was captivated by the sight. I heroically sprang from the wardrobe and trapped one. No, you didn't. One of them kicked me in the face when he was getting ready to swing his axe. I was awake enough to witness you jump out of the wardrobe, trip on the basket you were carrying, and end up on the floor next to the bed. Well... And then I believe they got scared and ran out of the room, jumping from the bed onto you and out of the door. It was only by a sheer lucky swing you managed to hit one in the leg and grab his ankle. I didn't know you were awake for that. I'm so glad I was. Well, I still caught one, didn't I? You did indeed. Well done. How's your hand, by the way? Yeah, it's fine. I should tell the listeners that Jackson got bitten by one of them in the struggle. They have sharp little teeth. Well, Jackson held him up by the ankle, and we asked the little fellow why they were running around stealing the teeth from the townsfolk. He tried to swing a punch or two at us first. Then he tried to grab my arm so he could bite it again. He didn't really get very far. I assured him that we were not going to put him down until he told us why they were stealing teeth. After some more struggling, and then the realisation that he was getting nowhere, he uttered the words, Because my master says. We asked him who his master was, again more struggling, and then another hit of realisation. He lives in the blue brick house, he told us. Old Tommy Totherington. The ex-elemental warlock of Witchhaven Lake. He gave up his position and his powers to run the tea room until he gave it to his daughter, Tabitha Totherington. Well, when the gnome told us that, we saw a swirl of water fade from his eyes and he turned back into an inanimate object. We put him back in the garden next to the pond and made our way over to the blue brick house to put this matter to rest. We knocked on the door and Tommy answered it. His greeting was very surprising. He said, hello you two, I know why you're here. I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Can I get you a cup of tea, maybe a biscuit? 
As you all will know, we certainly aren't people to turn down a cup of tea and a biscuit, so we went inside. He had the fire going already. I love an open fire. We sat down and he told us all about it. He wanted to get revenge on Mrs Clitheroe for making him lose his teeth when he was younger. Ah, the classic revenge story. Sorry, go on. Thank you. As I was saying, he wanted to get revenge on Mrs Clitheroe because when he was younger he was a massive fan of the pastries from the bakery. He had always had a sweet tooth and so every day he would get a box of her sugar-baked cupcakes which we all love, but we all know you have to brush your teeth for about 10 minutes afterwards, and the doctor recommends not to consume sugar for a week after consumption. But a box a day! And it was for this reason he had lost a couple of teeth, and he blamed Mrs Clitheroe, so he wanted her to lose a couple of her own teeth. That's why he brought the gnomes to life. He would have gotten away with it too, if it weren't for us meddling kids. You promised me you wouldn't say that line. I couldn't help it, it just kind of fits with this case. We asked him why he had targeted other people. He said that after bringing the gnomes to life, he found them so funny, he wanted to see them again, and things just got a little bit out of hand. But he did promise not to do it again. And that just about brings us up to the witching hour. We just have time for a few community announcements. Dr Teeth says that anyone that had fallen victim to the gnomes can go and see him and he'll fix you up free of charge. The Wailing Spectre has been seen more and more around the theatre, and the Crying Jester or Clown has been sighted a couple of times, so if you do go to see the Giant's Eye, take caution. And Mr Tinker's Shoe Shop will be open later than usual this coming Wednesday, because he says the elves want the overtime. I think that's it from us tonight. We will wish you a good night, and remember, a sweet tooth can come back and bite you. Thank you for listening to Tales from Witchhaven. This podcast was brought to you from the minds of Dan Lee and Rodeo Writer, produced by Rodiax. If you have enjoyed your stay, please like, subscribe and follow us as we explore more mysteries from this sleepy little town. Beware, the witching hour draws near.